Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another chapter of Experiencer Interviews. And tonight, we've got a very special show for you guys. Uh, she's been, uh, my guest has been very active in the UFO community. Her name's Rebecca Hardcastle Wright. Uh, for those who haven't had the pleasure of meeting Rebecca, uh, Rebecca is an author, futurist, and the founder of IXO, the Institute for Exo Consciousness. She is a leading researcher in the psychology and future of ET and multi-dimensional experiencers. As a therapist, lifelong contactee, and exo consciousness coach, Rebecca's work centers on exo consciousness humans, assisting experiencers in integrating and applying their long-term contact. Her most recent book, Exo Consciousness Humans: Claiming Psychic Intelligence in a Transhuman World, focuses on preserving and advancing carbon-based human consciousness incorporating innate abilities of cosmic consciousness. Some of her books are also uh, available. Uh, they are Exo Consciousness, Your 21st Century Mind, and How Exo Consciousness, Consciousness Humans Guide Our Spacefaring Future. IXO is committed to seeding next generation in, uh, inventions and innovations co-created by entrepreneurs, ETs, and multidimensionals. As a member of Apollo 14 astronaut, Dr. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, uh, Mitchell's Quantech International Science Team, Rebecca integrated zero-point energy, consciousness, and the ET presence, which guided her IXO commitment to mainstreaming co-created inventions and innovations. For more information, you can log on to Rebecca's website, exoconsciousness.com. So thank you so much for coming on, Rebecca. Thank you, Yannick. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I really had the trouble with the word exoconsciousness for some reason. It's a long word, uh, yeah. but it says a lot. <laughs> yeah, one hell of a tongue twister. Um, so uh, regarding your um, your lifelong work on, uh, you know, in the, in the community, um, did uh, did your experiences uh, push you to um, to be so heavily involved, or um, you know, did did something happen that really like one day decided to, to get you, uh, you know, active so much? Well, I actually think that it was kind of just my experiences, which with extraterrestrials and multidimensionals is ongoing. It's different now than, you know, when I was a child, but it just all moved through very different phases um, in my life that kind of all, Sometimes they circle back around, sometimes something new comes in, but um, I think it's why I came here. One of the reasons I came here to earth. I mean, one of the reasons I came here to earth was to be a mother and have children and, and have a family. But another reason that I came is, was to be a therapist and, and to work in that area, but also to be um, someone that was uh, an experiencer since childhood and to bring that information forward and be transparent about it. What I know about my experiences and what I don't know about my experiences and to study that and, and, and like, like the work you're doing, Yannick, you know, to form communities where people can come together and talk about it. Mm. But it's never been, um, I never really felt like I had an absolute blueprint as to what I was doing mostly because my experiences started, my conscious experiences started about the age of three. So, so pre three years old, you're what's called precognitive. So you don't really, you don't have cognition in the same way you and I have. No, no. And so um, my cognitive experiences started about the age of three. And, you know, as a three-year-old, you, you have a very different view of life. <laughs> Didn't you, yeah, have you move through life differently. Didn't you have something that started off uh, in the crib also? Well, I'm, I don't really call myself a crib contactee, but I have met them. But um, I have had people tell me that I was a crib contactee and actually given me dates of my contact. Really? That they picked up literally from doing body readings with me. Okay. So um, one one of which was about a month and a half after I was born. Mm. So how do you remember that, you know, those memories? Uh, are they flashes? Um, are and you, I, well, I also want to say, I've never really been, I've never been regressed to remember any crib contact. Okay. But I have actively, um, I'm a hypnotherapist. 
So I know a lot about hypnotherapy and how, how the tools used and all of that. So that did help me bring out a lot of memory about my three-year-old, my early childhood contacts, what happened to me. Okay. So, okay. So let's talk about the, uh, yeah, the experiences at the age of three. So, so what happened? What did you see? So my, I, I would say three years old, probably up, up until actually um, around fifth or sixth grade. I, I had a, a very, um, a very seamless interface with extraterrestrial beings in my life. And I, um, the most memorable things was a lot bedroom visitations, some of which scared me, gave me night terrors. Others that were very benign and I was fine with. Um, I also have a, a, a memory of, I, I lived in a small town in, um, in West Virginia. It's kind of in the middle of the United States, kind of in the heart of the United States. It's, it's Appalachia, so it's covered with a lot of woods and mining. So we have a lot of mines. So it's empty underground, a lot of places yeah. <laughs> in veins of, of different minerals. Yeah. But um, I, I, had, I, I, had a, I, I had a childhood where uh, being in a small town, I was allowed a lot of freedom. So I basically just, I was out the door and gone. Mm -hmm. Whether it was raining or snowing or sh uh, the sun was shining, I was gone. I was out. I was out playing, and I have I have very vivid memories of um, walking into a field and seeing a craft and being taken into that craft, and then after that, then being, you know, taken again and again to the point where I will meet people today and like. I'll think, oh boy, I know you. I've known you. Really? <laughs> you know, you've. I've been around you before. I mean, I'm, even to the extent of some people will like say, "I was on the craft with you, Rebecca," and I'm like, "Yeah, I, I think we were." And and I think on that craft, I was given a lot of. Um, I had a mentor on the craft who I think was probably a tall white. I'm not 100 percent so, sure of that, but so how tall are the tall whites? Um, I know you were a kid. Back being then, a child, so. I, I would say um, maybe seven foot tall, maybe okay. a little taller, but um, but the whiteness was kind of this vivid, um, ethereal kind of um, energy around them. So it was a very white, very very highly energetic being, very um, wow. kind of kind and. You know, I'm going to be with you in this. And um, did they project a, a gender? Did you feel he, uh, it was a man? A he man? was a man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I, I always kind of thought I was sort of, <laughs> this is kind of weird, but I always thought of myself as kind of, I'm sort of a Heinz 57. Mm. People say, oh, you know, you're a hybrid. And I'm like, oh, I think mm. I was pretty much a Heinz 57. You know, mm. I think. I've always had contact with a lot of different, a really broad spectrum of extraterrestrial races. And I think that was because that, that fed in then to my, and kind of anchored my exoconsciousness work okay. where I wasn't just a Palladian or just do, a, a Lyran or just a, you know, Do you remember how they showed up to you while you, in your bedroom? When you were a kid, did they come through like uh, the, the closet? Yeah, they came from, they were closet. Most of the time, the most distinct ones were closet beings. Imagine that. So, you know, yeah. imagine, you know, growing up and we're always talking about, you know, the, the, the monster in the closet. So how many of us really had experiences without actually knowing it? They also met me outside. So I also had outside meetings with them. So, so do you think you were... Um, did they tell you to come out or were you? Uh, no, I think I was just outside. Okay. So they I mean, showed I up. don't know, but my sense is that I was just outside. You know, they could have told them, me. I have no idea. You know, some experiencers do get the feeling they have to go out. Yeah. Come out outside. Yeah. Point, yeah. I don't really remember any of that. I just remember being outside, but I was outside all, all the time. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I lived and, in the woods too, so. Yeah, yeah. so it's very different. Yeah. It's a very different childhood. And then, um, so in the craft, I, I remember there would be like one-on-one sessions, but then there would be like group sessions where I would be like part of this class and kind of this, you know, these walls that would move and this kind of amphitheater and these other other kids with me. And sometimes actually there would be, I have a memory of military people standing on the periphery. Okay. I don't know if they were American military or were they were military of other races. I don't know that. But I was told as a child to be respectful. Okay. You know, that because so I was wear, sort of, were, so they were, I guess they were wearing normal. Well, they were uh, uniform. Uniforms. And okay. my and maybe it was just the uniform. I don't know. Maybe just the uniform I was picking up. And as a child, I was equating that with, oh, those must be military people. Okay. But I was told as a child on the craft to be to be respectful of everyone that was on the craft. Interesting. But I kind of picked up from them that they were at a different level of learning than I was on that craft, that they were maybe there for a different purpose or a different level of learning or a different intention than I was on that craft. So were you being taught, uh, was the, you know, the, the tall white your, your teacher or was it somebody else? No, he was my teacher and my mentor. Your mentor, okay. Yeah, and I, I was taught a lot of like symbolic star language kind of thing, I think. As a group, I was, I was, when I was in these groups, I was introduced to people that maybe later in life I would start to work with or people that would come in and out of my life. Um, I don't really remember any examinations or anything like that. I, I never had that. Um, and, and my entry and exit was always very gentle. I never had any feeling like I was being, you know, abducted or taken or anything like that. But interestingly enough, so I'm having this kind of cosmic experience on the one hand, and then the other hand, because I live in this area of mines, in this area of kind of porous earth, holes in the earth, <laughs> there's a big mining company in my town. So porous earth. And I had, I had experiences when I was a little older, probably like, I don't know, six or seven of literally being pulled under the ground by beings. How? Uh, uh, astrally? Physically? No, physically being pulled under the ground by these beings. And I would kind of like reptilian kind of underground beings. And, and being familiar with them. And then the other feeling, so I'm being pulled underground. I, I don't know. I was from West Virginia. We would call it a hollow. So I would go be playing down in this hollow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would be sucked down and I would, I would be, you know, kind of working with these beings. We'd be going and doing different things. But then there was this, this great feeling that when I, I came back that literally I just shot out of the earth. They just pushed me up out of the earth. Mm. And interestingly enough, I never really knew what was going on there until I'm an adult and I'll never forget the day I'm sitting in this town. I lived in near Phoenix and I'm sitting out on my patio. It's a beautiful day. And I, somebody had given me this book on shamanism and I thought, oh, so I'm reading this book on shamanism. They're talking about going on the underground and working with these energies. And I'm like, that's what I was doing as a kid. That's, I was a shaman worker as a child. I went into the underworld. I went, I went down into the underworld. Do you remember what you actually did underground? Yeah, we moved energies. We moved energies. And it was kind of like a light show down there, like just energetic, moving things around and it's funny, like once I read that book, then be these beings would come back to me after that and they would say, and they would say, oh, you need to come with us. And I would, I would go with them. 
And we would literally be taken to different spots around the earth to like do energetic earth work. Mm. So, so how do you get, how did you get from one place to the other? I guess in, a, in an astral way, I suppose. Okay. But I remember it was always, I never did that work independently. I always did that work. You needed to be with a group. I don't know if they were trying to sort of like jog my memory or I don't know. Okay. So um, was it? And maybe... I don't even know if my shamanism connection is even right. Oh. I'm just saying that it seemed to be a bridge to what I was doing. So was it? Uh, it is it? it a, just, was it a, um, a reptilian intervention? They were. They oh. were very reptilian like. And I can always know they're going to be around me because they thump their tails. Oh, okay. That's a good one. So they're very loud. They're a very loud, massive energy. But they never scare me. Really? I've been hearing that. But I always felt like they were, um, I I, I always felt like, you know, people are sort of, oh, the reptilians, you know, the shape-shifting reptilians. Well, humans have been shape-shifting for years. You know, go to any Native American reservation or Canadian first 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 people reservation there's gonna be some shape shifting going on at some point yeah. right mm-hmm. so um i i never felt like they were evil or bad as a matter of fact i felt like they were earth protectors that they that they were sort of part of this planetary dimension to protect the earth and that 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 was their mission and for us to demean them and demonize them was doing them a great disservice Wow. You know, I never felt like they felt like they own the earth and we don't or anything like that. But yeah, I I think they're just, they're, they're, they're a dimension that uh, they, they, they dwell in a dimension and have a civilization that's, it's kind of like if you take the hydrogen out of water, you don't want to take reptilians out of the earth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I hear you. That, that dimension, if you, if you, put your turkey baster in there and sucked it all out, that would probably not enhance earth. Yeah, and I imagine they've been there for a long time. So yeah, yeah. who are we really to, yeah. to move them out? Um, so that but, happened fairly when you were, you were, you were young though, when this happened. I was young. And I also have to add that this area of Appalachia that I, li- that I lived in, um, in, in West Virginia, and this kind of, you know, mountainous, mountainous actually 70 percent it was founded by abraham lincoln during the civil war so as a northern state so they cut out part of virginia and made west virginia a state and what um i think what lincoln was doing was he was paying off the war debt by giving this pieces of the state to the mining and then the industrialists of the time so only about 70 percent of the state was really able to be um, civilized and you know settled but when it was settled, it was primarily settled by kind of Scotch Irish English people who, you know, if you're going to move to an area like that, you're moving there because you want to maintain your old ways. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you do tend to, uh, you know, a lot of your, your people tends to move, you know, we do move around with the, you know, the same families and you, you do uh, yeah. colonize them. My, uh, I'm a quarter British too. Uh-huh. So yeah, a lot of, you know, I, I found out thanks to the, uh, you know, my, my British ex fiance that the, uh, mm-hmm. the, the family line that was noble, mm-hmm. they're nobles back in Britain. Mm-hmm. So, but you know, they, they fled to the States and that's when they, they, they fled up to Canada because of the, uh, you know, the, the war against the, you know, the, against Britain. But yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting that a lot of, um, people that migrated to these kind of mountainous areas to do what they wanted to be independent, oh, to yeah. live independent lives, also uh, are spawns from families um, that are very well connected back in countries like England or France. And actually, those relatives are often um, allied with mystery schools. Oh, so do you know, do you know why you, you're, uh, you're living these experiences? Was it uh, you don't have any military family? Mm-hmm. 
the same as me. So yeah, there's there's this, maybe something related to your bloodline. Your because you're you're part Scottish, I think you said. Yes, yeah, Scotch, Irish, German. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, there's a Nordic thing. English. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it's always fun to. Some Scandinavian. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, there's a a Nordic thing. So th that's pretty cool. So did did anything ha happened after um, those events? Well, after those events, I, uh, I kind of, that was sort of my um, fundamental training, or my fundamental, and I actually, I, I'm kind of the believer that most of us come into life, you know, we incarnate into our physical bodies. And, you know, we kind of, we, we go through that transition that the metaphysical people talk about, you know, crossing the river of tears, or moving through the veils. And when you cross that river of tears, your, your, your whole plan that you had put forth as a spiritual being to incarnate is sort of wiped from your memory. Okay. And I'm, I really wonder when I looked at what happened to me was, was this, was this a deliberate reinsertion of that memory back into me as a child so that I, so that I would remember what I was to be about and what I was to do. So do, do you think you have a contract that you signed something beforehand coming, coming into this world? You know, some, some experiences do tend to talk about, you know, these, oh, these I, think, I think anybody that is a public experiencer like you or me mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, we have some kind of contract or agreement or, you know, Light we're going to do our work. And yet, and yet mm -hmm. I know people that, felt the same way and were very public about their experiences and they chose not to be public and they, they broke the agreement and they went a different way and they're fine. Yeah. So, you know, some, if it weren't for the, uh, the meeting of my, you know, the, my, my ex fiance there, I wouldn't be here. So you know, there's a lot of synchronicity involved and mm -hmm. like really being moved around. So, you know, I guess we, some of us do have these sort of, kick in the butt, uh, you've got something to do event. Mm -hmm. And you so, can choose to do it or not choose to do it. Yeah. You, yeah, you're right. And you'll be, you're okay either way. Yeah. You I know, you're so. not going to be, you know, go Punished. to damnation or something if yeah. you don't fulfill your contract. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably going to come back around and do it a different way, different yeah. time. Have, have a redo. Here's your redo. So, um, do you, like, being underground, you know, that fascinates me because, you know, I also work in a mining town. I've, I've worked, uh -huh. in, you know, I'm a, I've got a college degree in geology, so I work underground. Uh, and uh, do you recall what type of environment where you were in underground? Were they uh, like tunnels? There uh, were tunnels in some places. It almost felt like they were like pathway staircases and pathways. There was like you could like reach out and like you could feel the water in places. You could see pools of like underground water systems where I was. Really? Wow. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes it reminds me of, uh, you know, I, I used to watch, you know, Stargate on TV. Uh -huh. And they, uh, they, you know, they, they, there were a few episodes where they were under, underground and these, the, uh, you know, the aliens had these, had these, these crystals that would create these man-made yeah. tunnels. So... Yeah, yeah we've I, got, I, I find it fascinating. well, we as humans have pretty sophisticated underground technology too. Mm -hmm. We've actually had earth melting, earth melting technology since the fifties. Really? I remember seeing those, those huge drills that, mm -hmm. but, uh, a really good person you might want to interview on your show is, um, Richard Souder. Souder. Yeah. He wrote the whole he dedicated his life to uh, the part of his life to going to the um, Library of Congress and the archives and going through all of the information on underground um, building. Really? Underground installations. Fascinating. And, and now he lives in Ecuador. No kidding. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, he's written two books about um, the underground technology and underground extraterrestrial. And I think he wrote another book on underwater extra extraterrestrials. Hmm. So are you one to do CE fives? Do you I don't do CEs. You don't do that? I don't do CEs. Oh. I'll tell you a funny story why I don't do CEs. Okay. So um so I live in Phoenix, right? 
1987. It's a Phoenix Lights. You heard of Phoenix Lights? Yeah. yeah. 1987. So I lived there. I know all these people in that ET field. I know all these people that are ufologists and, you know, you name it. Because there's a big community of that in Phoenix. And I just had happened to moved to this town that had literally the longest, uh, a woman who became my mentor, it was the longest running experiencer group in the nation at the time that I just happened to move to the town and join that group. So I knew a lot of people. So it's 1987 and the uh, Phoenix Lights happens and guess what? I don't see it. I don't hear about it. I don't Mm. see it. Lynn Kitai, who was the key witness, is one of my best friends. The three or four other guys that were the chief researchers are close friends of mine. I didn't see it. And when that happened, a part of me was like, what the heck? What the heck? And the other part of me was this just this kind of, you know, just this deep knowing that I was not supposed to be a craft researcher because all my friends that saw the Phoenix lights became craft researchers. <laughs> and I, my field was to be consciousness. I was to work in the field of consciousness. And so interestingly enough, after that time, a couple of years later, that's when this whole word exoconsciousness came into my came into my, my being. It was, it was given to me. It was gifted to me. So I'm not a CE5 person. I, that's not how I'm supposed to work. Others are, that's just not for me. Okay. Um, before finishing off the, uh, well, let's say um, I'm fascinated with, you know, the type of crafts that, you know, these child uh, experiencers go on to. Do you, do you recall what type of, you know, the, of, you know, what type of craft you're on? Was it a saucer? It was, yeah, it's more of a saucer kind of craft. It was on the ground. Okay. Yeah. Um, it had kind of the sort of, you know, the walls that were almost alive. And I talk about it in my book, um, Exoconscious, uh, Exoconsciousness, Your 21st Century Mind. That was really the book where I went more deeply into what my experiences were. But um, I talk about just being one of my experiences as a child is that I I had the experience of navigating the craft with my consciousness. Wow. So then that led me, that's really led me into sort of consciousness technology and um, the, 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 the deep and, and essential parts of, the human, natural human that, that we carry, like I, that during that experience, I knew star maps, I knew navigation, I knew, I knew how that, that craft was alive and I knew how to navigate and steer and propel it. I, I knew what I was doing. And so actually my whole work in exoconsciousness today is, and this, this new book I have coming out with, is just about that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. That we have this cosmic consciousness that is that is a very important part of us and if we allow you know transhumanism and synthetic biology to interfere with it we may lose it okay wow so you you remember being taught to actually you know pilot the craft i they didn't teach me i just knew you knew okay i was a child i just knew yeah wow okay um all right so let's get into um so all of your experiences brought you up to this day to, to, to the point that you know you, you had the you know the term exoconsciousness and in, in, in you so what happened after that what you know your books came out uh, did you did you write the um your um like your your first book did that happen before meeting uh dr edgar mitchell no that was sort of in sync that was interesting so um just real quickly, um, I tell this a lot, but it doesn't hurt to retell it again. But so I, at the time that I was given that word exoconsciousness, I was, um, I, I was a single mom and I had, uh, I had kids at home. And so my, I had one of those uh, 
radio alarm clocks that with the snooze button. And so it went off and like I hit this, I remember hitting the snooze button and falling back asleep, you know, wanting to fall back asleep, putting my head back on the pillow and thinking, you know, oh, golly, I gotta, I gotta lie down here for like five more minutes before I, you know, put the kids lunch just together, get to work, do all these things I need to do. And I remember putting my head back on the pillow and this word exoconsciousness just was like downloaded, but not into my brain. It was downloaded to my entire cellular body. Wow. So it kind of like, it, it kind of became my flesh. <laughs> Was yeah, what you, happened. You were meant to use the word. Yeah. And I, I think that part of the reason that that word came to me was because at the time I had been um, researching and reading books and, you know, thinking about what my experiences meant and what consciousness meant. And so I had kind of gone through this sort of preparatory initiation period that I think that it was just determined that I was ready to receive this word. And so, and then I knew that my, my life purpose then was to sort of nurture this word and bring it out into, into the public um, nomenclature so that people would use it. Mm -hmm. Wow, okay. So how and, did you get, yeah, okay, no, continue. So with Edgar, yeah. so I, I published my book and, um, I'm going on my first, it was actually to Laughlin, my first book tour with the book to sell and promote. And at that conference, I get a call asking whether or not I want to go, come work with Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. And I'm like, oh, so I said, we well, probably, yeah, that sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm like awestruck. And uh, I go home and we have a couple more conversations. And then from that conversa those conversations, it becomes very apparent that if I work with him, I'm not gonna be doing exoconsciousness anymore. I'm gonna be working with scientists and, and zero point energy and consciousness, but that I had to let that book go and my, my mission with exoconsciousness go. And I did. I chose to do that. It just felt right. Mm -hmm. And actually, I'm glad I did. Now looking back, because I think that that gave me a just like with your work, like sometimes you go places and you get on these learning curves that you think are right and you hope are right, but end up giving you this whole foundation that you would have never had otherwise. And that's what my work with him did. And did so you, then when he passed away, then I, I went back into my work with exoconsciousness. Did you publish any book or paper uh, during that, you know, that time or what? what uh... No, I actually, he had a, a team of international scientists and he was working on things like the quantum hologram and what we were doing, we were really a zero point energy um, support you know, we wanted to support the research and the applications of zero point energy, you know, truly kind of before it's time. Yeah. And um, I, so I was asked to move from Phoenix to Washington, D.C. to work with Edgar and be the representative for Quantrek in Washington, D.C. But make no mistake, and I did work with these scientists, read a lot of scientific papers, did a very, very steep learning curve. But make no mistake, Ed, Edgar asked me to come and work with him because I am an experiencer. Okay. So he, he had a very deep respect for people who were, were experiencers and felt that you know, my input was, was important from that, from that aspect. Well, you, you do have a different uh, a different point of view that some, I guess, normies wouldn't have. You, you, you've right. been there, you've seen it, and, right? Uh, yeah. And and I did have, and 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 I knew I was meant to do what I was doing when I uh, 
well, I would get these papers, these scientific papers, and I would start reading them. And I'm like, ah, oh, what are they talking about? I don't really, I get this, but most of it I don't get. And I would go to bed and go to sleep and get a download and wake up in the morning and I would understand the paper. Really? That's so neat. That's pretty cool. So I met some wonderful, yeah. wonderful um, researchers. And then that experience was what led me into, into the Institute, into founding the Institute. Okay. Because I, I know Ray, Ray Hernandez, you know, met up yeah. with, you know, yeah. Dr. Mitchell and started, yeah. the, you know, the free. Yeah. Now, I was involved with free for, you know, in the beginning. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I helped out with the, the French survey. Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. So we, uh, I've met Ray in 2016 too, so that was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Um, so when did, is, uh, is you know, the, the Dr. Mitchell's uh, team or like the group still uh, active right now? No, not really. No. Uh, I think different factions. I think um, Rudy Shield was part of it. So he's, in, in a sense, he was. He wasn't really a zero point energy person, but like he's working with, with Ray now. But no, the other scientists are really kind of going their own way. But I picked it up because I, I, I was very moved by the fact that we were working with, you know, many, you know, PhD level scientists that worked at labs or worked at universities and were very esteemed, but we would also get information from, from people that were experiencers and lived literally out in the middle of nowhere mm -hmm. and had done this amazing science and had these theories um, that were applicable, yeah. but they didn't really have the wherewithal or the support to make them come mm -hmm. to a reality. So that's, that's really one of the things that, that that seating with Dr. Mitchell, as well as the seating in the extraterrestrial experiencer group that I was in, uh, that I was in this little extraterrestrial experiencer group. We had probably had 20 people, maybe 10 people on a good night, 20 people all in. And out of that little group, we, we ended up publishing like five or six books. People invented medical devices, other kinds of inventions. I mean, people are doing amazing things. And I sort of took that piece and then I took the Edgar piece with the, with the experiencers that were inventors. And I said, there's got to be, you know, part of why I'm here isn't just to talk about my experience or to talk about consciousness, but it's really to do something with it. Yeah. And so I, I literally created a doorway for myself after he died. After he passed away, I created a doorway and I thought, I have to walk through this doorway and I have to find a way to create this institute to be of service and support to experiencers who are, have inventions in, uh, across the whole spectrum. If it's education or technology or science or healing or agriculture or the arts or communication, that's what the Institute supports. We want to support you. We want to help you use what's been given to you. Because being an experiencer isn't just a one-off. <laughs> it's really about integrating it. And this is what I do with my exoconscious coaching. It's really about integrating it into your entire life, how you solve problems, how you look at life, and very importantly, what you create. Okay. Have you had what you co-create? Um, did you have any trouble regarding, um, I don't know, uh, you know, military? Because you know they don't, they don't tend to want experiencers come out with, you know, at least you know, new tech ideas or you know, the inventions that or technology that they seen on craft. I know Susie Hansen had you know, loads of trouble with that. So um, yeah, I think that. Um... That, of, you know, I'm certainly not naive. I certainly, um, you know, I lived in Washington, D.C. and worked with Edgar for about six years. So I'm certainly not naive about that aspect yeah. of what's going on. But regardless of that aspect, I also feel that um, we have a time and we have an opportunity. And because we are experiencers, that we have um, a co-creative support system. Yeah. That, that goes with that. Now, 
am I envisioning something that's going to replace NASA or, you know, going to replace Elon Musk? Well, of course not. But what I am seeing, what I am seeing is that we are going into an era that even though there's a lot of talk about, oh, we're all one family, we're all one globe, you know, we're all just love each other and get along together. The fact of the matter is things are very um, di- diverse. And because of the diversity, there's a win- there are windows of opportunities for us to bring forth this information. For example, I feel a lot of that's and what my this next book I have coming out with is that synthetic biology or unnatural biology, it's called synthetic biology, nanoparticles, the COVID vaccine, yeah. all, all of that sort of thing. Those are those are going to um, invade the human body. And we experiencers need to be thinking about because our bodies are so important to us. So for an experiencer, your body's really important. Yeah. You, you need all those, you know, um, you know, chakras and meridians and this energy body, like you feel that maybe more than most people feel. And that's a real important thing for us. So I, I see that. Um, one of the ways that experiencers are going to navigate around transhumanism is to say, you know, we're going to come together as a community and we're going to develop an antidote for that vaccine. People that are having bad side effects or want to get the nanoparticles out of their body or want to get the mRNA out of their body, that we're going to be, you know, the antidote producing community. Now, is that going to be adopted by mainstream medicine? Of course it's not no no but it is going to be made available mm. to people that want to use it yeah you know the fact that there's actually a human that it, you know created that is you know, it, it, it's it's hectic it's it's so evil that they want to modify yeah, the thing it. i don't get is how can anyone create that yeah and create the surveillance system that's been created, which is really what my book is about also. Synthetic synthetic biology and the surveillance system are big in my book. And I sort of, I, I, I do a, a, like a description. This is what exoconscious humans bring forth. This is what transhumans bring forth. So every chapter kind of handles all of them. And then at the end of some chapters, I talk about a common ground. We do have a common ground because we use electromagnetic medicine and, yeah. you know, different things, good things that have come out of technology. Mm-hmm. But I keep thinking, why would anyone ever want to invent a synthetic biology invasive system that they weren't sure how it worked? Or a surveillance system that had kids and grandkids. Yeah. Why, yeah. why would you want to, you know, you your children and your grandchildren are going to be part of this. Yeah. Are, are you thinking about that? And, and it's not this one-off thing. Like everybody, I've not really seen the show, but I guess everybody talks about that social um, social media show that on Netflix that just talks about Facebook and social media. And these people are all saying things like, you know, Zuckerberg or whoever, like, Oh, my kids aren't on social media. They don't use social media. Well, that's fine to say about social media, but can you, are you going to be to say the same thing if nanoparticles and synthetic biologies in your child? Yeah. That's, that's a whole different league. And, and I always knew that I was here because I loved humans. Yeah. I love humans. I want mm-hmm. humans to thrive. I, I want humans to be healthy and, and have a good life and have a good planet. And I'm not saying everybody's a wonderful person and there's no evil or there's no disjointed or malevolent forces in life. Well, of course there are, but we're here too. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, uh, I remember uh, during the, uh, you know, in 2012, we thought, you know, the earth was going to, you know, something bad was going to happen to humanity. And I, I, I'd meditate a lot and try to send energy, you know, Thinking that you know the rivers would be clean, the oceans would be clean, humanity will be uh, detoxified because you know humanity is so sick. Is we, we've got so many toxins in the body that our body can't process anything. So, 
And during yeah. all that time, our government is pushing full force with weather modification. Yeah. Crazy, isn't it? Well, it's sort of like, I, I, I feel like these times are very demanding if you're an experiencer. You know, you it's it's kind of like, oh, it was nice. We kind of all went through this period where we could share our, our, our stories and find other people that had stories like we had and, you know, really kind of begin to feel like a community. But where we're at now, it's, it's really stepped up because this whole transhuman agenda, they're not going to let up. COVID is just, you know, the first strike. Yeah. There's, there's going to be no letting up. Social media, that's the first strike. This, this is not going to go away. And we experiencers as a community, as a community have got to step up and maturely say, what's our plan for this? What's our plan? What are we going to do? How are we going to navigate this? Yeah. How are we going to strategize around it? Well, I've been protesting with my girlfriend and uh, doing these uh, car movements. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, but I did protest in the rain a few times. And uh, mm -hmm. but, yeah, and there, you know, there's uh, I guess we're, we're awakened. So we're more aware of the pain that, you know, of, you know, of the things that might come how it's going to interact. And uh, uh, I tend, I tend to, I like to try to see the future somehow, sort of see the timelines, how that, you know, they might evolve. And um, I'm sad that, you know, the people around me don't try to think like that at all. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're very conscious of what's going on, but they're afraid or they're, they're, you know, the, they've been using the words, uh, you know, conspiracy theorist a lot in front of me. Mm -hmm. So again, they've been brainwashed by the CIA and, uh, and whatnot, you know, the, the whole TV where people say we're doomed. We're just, yeah. we're doomed. Yeah. We're doomed. I, I don't have to do anything. Yeah. Or I can't do anything. Yeah. Uh, there's no, yeah. but again, I know. But, I, I, maybe, but, but I, I kind of feel like looking at you that one of the, the opportunities is that experiencers are going to bring forth new forms of, of communication mm. and you're a communicator. Yeah. You, you might ever, be, yeah, you, you, you might be the one to, you know, bring forth a, a new communication that, you know, that you co-create with extraterrestrials yeah. assisting you. Yeah. Never know. I did try out the, uh, the Monroe Institute, um, gateway uh -huh. course. Uh-huh. Cause I was fascinated anything, you know, cause I've, I've had visions and stuff. So I just wanted to try to push that up a bit, try to maybe force an OBE. Or yeah. at least see, but you know, sometimes when I meditate, I close my eyes. Sometimes I see faces come to me or things from uh -huh. far away. And, um, I didn't, you know, I didn't do, I wasn't able to come out, but I had visions in front of me. And I sometimes, once I saw the face of a man looking back at me and then uh, another face appeared and another face, and they were all old men with beards. And the, uh, the guy who gave me the course said it was probably past life images yeah. of myself of yourself. Yeah. That was yeah. pretty cool. But uh, yeah, so, but yeah, I'm really fascinated with the whole, you know, telepathic aspect and you know, a lot of uh, child uh, contactees, experiencers or, you know, abductees, they, they do go through these courses where they learn how to be telepathic with each other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, you probably did that, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Back up there. Yeah. Yeah. You're quite lucky though. At least you know to remember that because not, not everyone remembers what they went through, but yours were very, uh, I guess benevolent uh experience. i feel that yeah. i feel i feel that they were benevolent but i'm also human so um and humans and i also am a human on earth and it's really important for me that i stay anchored in the 3d that i live in on the earth mm -hmm. and maintain those things that need to be maintained and don't just take it for granted okay so do you want to get into the uh, some questions regarding sure. extra consciousness? Sure. Yeah. That's. Uh, I know because your your new book's coming up uh, next year. Yeah. So yeah, that's gonna early be early uh, next year, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, let's uh, define exo consciousness and what are the main principles. Okay. Originally, I defined exo consciousness um, when I 
wrote my first book as the study. So it was more like, it was during the time Michael Sala was doing exopolitics and there was a real push on, like I taught a course at, at a college, a local college on, on UF on um, extraterrestrial reality. And we, we thought we believed back in 2005, we were going to be accepted into the academic realm. Wrong, yeah. <laughs> wrong idea there. <laughs> Didn't happen. So I, I defined it as the, um, the study of the extraterrestrial origins, dimensions, and abilities of human consciousness. So it's more like an academic. Okay. And then when I founded the Institute, I, I redefined it. And I defined it at that point as the innate. So that means everybody has it. So it's the innate human ability to... Um, to contact, communicate, and co-create with extraterrestrials and multidimensionals. So it's just a cosmic ability, uh, uh, abil an ability of psychic intelligence that we all possess. So didn't you do a doctorate in, in that yes. field, roughly? Okay. Yeah. Parapsychic science. Okay. Wow, that must, I had no idea that was out there. That, that must there's be a big, There's a big paranormal academic community, actually that examines, you know, sort of all facets of um, consciousness and psychic activity. And, but I have to say it's very small and that most of, I would, I would dare say that most of the, most of the psychic experimentations that are going on or going through with, you know, just small groups. I don't know if you've heard of the Skoll Foundation, SC. Yeah. Oh, Ellie. Yeah. Well, like they're, they're in Spain now. They were, I think, I think they were in England, weren't they? originally I think they were in England you know so they set up a whole group of experiments on channeling and making contact and um but you know they weren't affiliated with the university they were just a, a small private group okay so I think a lot of this research goes on among you know small private groups yeah I made the error of telling my boss once during a, a lunch hour uh, you know we were we were having lunch at you know downtown and I told him that my name appeared in a, a ufology book. But, you know, I was with geologists and they all thought that, you know, a ufology or geology was something like, a, like scientific. And they were, they were all amazed until I told them it was, you know, in a UFO book. And they all looked at me and my boss told me, do you ever talk about this? I thought I was going to lose my job. Yeah. So to have, you know, a psychic thing, uh, you know, doctorate out there, that's... That's pretty well amazing. in the nineties was when um, in the early nineties was when, well, prior to the nineties. So for 400 years, consciousness and psychic abilities and mysticism and metaphysics was all controlled by the church. So it's only recently in our lifetime in the nineties that universities started opening up consciousness departments to actually study this. Okay. So it's a new, we're, we're, re we're really living through a new era in this. Okay. And I would say that, um, you know, I don't know when you said that to your boss, but I mean, in 2017, it was front page of New York Times. Really? Yeah. Front page of New York Times, all about UFOs and the government spending money to research them. Yeah. And no, he's not much into that. So uh. no chance. Um, so okay, as well, above, so below, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> He's well, not seeing it, right? <laughs> no, no. But yeah, well, you know, being an experiencer, you do tend to influence others. Um, I've got a friend geologist that has. Uh, she's always coming up to me with these dreams that always happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the time, all the time. So I love like, that. And but she's very religious. Okay, so when I talked about talked about my shadow being experienced in my bedroom, she thought they were sorcerers. So you see, yeah. that's how, you know, they're manipulated, they're, they're brought into this, you know, because of religion into this world. But, you know, they've got these facets about the supernatural and they're, they're, everything's evil. And, uh, but yeah, hopefully uh, I'm, I'm pushing her to accept more, you know, regarding well, you know, our people. You can't, if you're, you know, if you're a Christian, I, I assume she's a Christian, right? Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you just have to look at the whole, um, she should start looking into Christian mysticism. Yeah. The whole history of mysticism. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always talking about beings and visions and I know. I know. But I guess they're uh, maybe she's a mystic and doesn't know it. Yeah, she she probably is, yeah. 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 
when everything's, I think uh, the, the Old Testament's more about that than the, the, the New Testament, I'd imagine. So yeah, there's, and the Old, you know, the Old Testament, there's a lot more regarding that, but. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. Uh, okay, let's get into another question. Uh, what personal experiences influence the awareness, conception, application, and value of exoconsciousness? Well, I think we, I kind of answered that when I yeah. talked about Dr. Cover's group and, okay. you know, my experiencer group and then um, Dr. Mitchell. I, I just feel like, you know, we are going to be, I have to say, overwhelmed by new, by things that have kind of been in the pipeline for decades. I don't know if you've studied like, you know, the black budget or the missing trillions of dollars. Yeah, I've heard about them, yeah. Yeah, so all of these are funding all of these underground installations and space installations and, you know, um, uh, rod of God technologies and, and different kinds of weaponry yeah. and zero point energy. So all of this is going to eventually be kind of trickle out into into culture and we're going to be like, oh, wow, that's really great. And alongside that, we have the opportunity as that starts to trickle out to us to also say, as experiencers, we have things that we need to bring forward. And if you're going to listen to that, yeah. then you need to listen to us too. Yeah. And sometimes they over, they're going to overlap. I do have to believe that, you know, there's a reason we've got these experiences happening that, you know, we do have something to contribute and we should. Uh, now I, I try to get a lot of other experiencers to get involved or at least come on my show. And, uh, you know, the stories are amazing and, and you know, there's a, they're afraid how people, you know, they're, how they're being perceived or even, uh, yeah, you know, one, one from overseas, uh, she wanted to come on and then out you know, last minute she had to cancel, but, but I do that believe that we do have something to contribute. Um, well, I think a lot of that and something that I teach in my exoconscious coaching is how do we, you know, we as experiencers are kind of wired for this experience. It could have been because of our childhood. It could have been because of maybe traumatic experiences, maybe ill as a child, but we, we seem to be wired to have psychic kind of visions and experiences. And when those happen, we have to accept kind of on a spiritual level that that's what we signed up for in our life. It didn't happen by accident. We signed up, we, we played a role in making that decision to come to earth and be wired for this kind of experience. So a lot of my coaching is helping people just feel safe and secure about being an experiencer. So did, do you do regressions too? I can do regressions. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, I noticed a lot of people, they're already in touch with what happened to them. They just don't want to admit it. Mm. Don't you feel that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't really get, I don't meet traumatic uh, experiencers. Right. You know, they, they, a lot of it was benevolent, good. I myself didn't have anything bad happen. So yeah, it, it's a small percentage, I think. Well, that's what the free research turned up uh, was that um, like I wrote a chapter in the free book and the, one of the things I pointed out was, you know, after all these decades of abduction research and, you know, David Jacobs and, you know, all these horrible things happen to people when they're abducted that in the free research over and over 75% of the people said it was a benevolent experience and they weren't abducted. And like 90 some percent of them said that they had an agreement to do it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's like for all those years of propaganda about abduction and all these horrific stories, how much of that was propaganda? Oh yeah, that's quite possible. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you can't, the disconnect between the, the free survey and the propaganda for decades, it's amazing. They, mm -hmm. they, it's not a fit. It does not fit together. Something was askew. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you define exoconsciousness human as CE6? That's a pretty good question. Okay. So yeah. um, 
So Alan Hynek, Alan Hynek developed the close encounter mm -hmm. definitions. Mm -hmm. So he had CE um, one, two, and three, which was mostly, you know, a daylight sighting, a nighttime sighting, you know, that sort of thing. And then um, Jacques Vallée came along and said, there's CE4. Yep. So CE4 is really more about abduction and linking it back into the mythology of, of, um, of humans. Um, different, you know, contact, especially in England, the folklore, mm -hmm. passport to his book, Passport to Mangonia, linking that back in and talking about, you know, the reality, how your reality shifts when you have these, you know, folklore-esque kind of encounters. And then after that, then Stephen Greer came forward with CE5 and his idea of CE5 is, you know, you, you look outside yourself. So you're going up into the sky and you're um, asking for a mutually um, beneficial contact outside yourself with craft. And so as I wrote the, as I wrote my chapter for Ray, in uh, Ray Hernandez in the free book, I'm like, well, then we're CE6. Because exoconscious humans, it's not about looking at craft or looking for craft. That's, that's all well and good. But the real issue for us is what happens to our personal consciousness. How are we, how is my concept, how does my self, concept of self change because I had an encounter in spirits? How does my concept of self-worth change? How do my uh, innate abilities change? So it's a human-centered contact, close encounter. So it's not, it's not, so for an exoconscious human, CE6, it's not about, oh, you know, what did the beans wear and how many fingers did they have? And, you know, what was their craft like? It's all about, so, what was the impact? What was your personal impact? Okay. How did your personal impact unfold? And what difference does it make for you? Were you? Did you get healed? Did you learn how to heal other people? Did you become telepath? I mean, if you look at Ray's survey, most people became, had some kind of physical um, change, transformation that happened. Many of them became healers. So it's kind of like moving it from outside ourselves for a CE5 into our self, inner self-examination, inner self-awareness. Yeah, well, it does change uh, us really. You know, these experiences, they're, they're with us for, you know, our entire life. And thanks to, you know, what I've been through, um, my, I guess, my appreciation of life, uh, you know, changed and my fear of death is non-existent anymore. I had an open heart surgery in 2016. Oh, wow. So I went through a lot of fear, but yeah. during those events, a lot of, I had contact, you know, they, 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 would, come, they would come at night and they'd wake me up. They, they'd touch me like twice. Oh. Like they, they tap me all the time. Like, hey, you're not alone. You're not alone. Because my mom passed away. And oh. you know, from, from 2009 to 2016, every month or so, They'd come back, tap me on my back, and sometimes twice during the same night, tap, tap, yeah. here and tap, tap. And I'd wake up and I'd smile. And I, I knew somebody was out there. And, you know, when we talked before the show, you know, the female being and stuff like that, the other stuff happened that um, eventually when uh, I broke up with my fiance, the, uh, for those of you that, you know, the, we know my story, the, this might be redundant, but um, uh, the British uh, fiance contact you had to go back to, to the UK, and uh, when we, we we had to break up eventually. So um, I was living with, living with my dad. You know, the, I lost my job. My dad, my mom passed away, so I had to take care of my dad. And so it was it was really a, a hard time for me. And uh, I haven't heard from her in like a few months. And I, we weren't gonna talk. You know, it was over. Okay, and I, I sent her a lot of emails, and nothing came back. And one time, I I cried to the universe. Okay. I'm an experiencer that, you know, they listen and, um, but I wasn't expecting anything. Uh, I was uh, like almost suicidal. That's how dark it went. And uh, I saw, so I sent her an email just like thanking her for the good times at seven thirty. So there's a, a five hour difference. 
this is she was asleep back then okay she uh, maybe an hour or two after she uh, she writes back after not sending me an email for months and she says yannick what's going on i get a uh, I've, I, uh, somebody starts speaking to me while i'm sleeping and the message was wake up now then i write her i write back is he okay i just you know i was talking to the universe everything's fine the few I'm, I'm glad the voice was female and non-human okay is he okay I, i'm uh hope you're hope you're okay i'm gonna get a couple a cup of tea now you know she's british i got this email so this is you no know, we're, we're being watched on so these experiences change you and you know that you're not alone and there's you no know, there's nothing you know death that it's not the end so so yeah that's that. that's a beautiful story yeah so we we uh we do have guides or i don't know if there's it could be family or i don't know and whatnot but so yeah so these these uh i did and i think i did write that down in the the free uh survey mm -hmm. you know the first one i didn't have much to enter in the second one but mm -hmm. yeah i'm glad you were involved yeah ray's really nice um so let me that's see uh story. yeah so, okay, more about uh, CE6. How does CE6, uh, exoconsciousness, human change the, I know we, we talked about that. Um, okay, so so uh, you've been quite active. Uh, are you working on anything right now other than you know, the books that are going to come out? Well, I just finished my book. So that was a long, that was a long slog. I actually started writing that book three years ago, almost four years ago now. And I, being in Washington, D.C., I started just learning about synthetic biology and transhumanism and, and the whole um, surveillance infrastructure that was in space. And I got so depressed. <laughs> I'm like, this can't be. And yet there was something there all along that's kind of behind you get that nudge, like just keep, just keep reading, just keep reading. And so for a long time, I was like, I can't, I want to write a book, but I can't write a book because it's, I'm too scared. I'm too frightened. I'm too traumatized by all this information. And it literally took me until about a year ago that I finally settled down enough to say, okay, I can write the book now. It's primarily going to be about exoconsciousness and we humans, but I'm also going to juxtapose it or compare it to transhumanism and what's going on in this culture and I'm going to be safe doing it but it was a very emo very deep emotional experience for me okay. and then I'm finishing it up and COVID hits and COVID is like the perfect showcase for the book <laughs> So all these things in the book were like, I was, I was being prepared. This just isn't about the book. This is about preparing me for COVID mm. all those years. Yeah. Makes sense. Wow. So, so and I, I also it. think that it's tied. You know, I don't know this, this is just a feeling, but, um, I think that I've probably had lives. I probably have come in during different times of this during, you know, we're really going through literally a, a genetic change in humans at this point. And I think I've probably been um, active in some way and, you know, dimensionally or on earth or other, other places when things like this have happened, you know, maybe, Atlantis, I'm maybe an Atlantis type being. Okay. Because I look at Atlantis and I think, you know, we hear a lot about an Atlantis and we think like they were like crystalline, you know, very high dimensional, high consciousness light beings. And part of me is like, well, maybe they should have been a little bit more 3D yeah. <laughs> so they didn't blow themselves up. Right. <laughs> so yeah. I'm always like, I'm always cheering for the 3D gang, you know. <laughs> Let's do our science. Let's let's be careful. Let's let's mm -hmm. think things through. Let's plan. Let's don't just leap into this, you know, make believe um, scenario that it, it's driving everything now. All these scenarios are what's defining our reality. 
So what's your take on disclosure? We've been talking about that since forever. And, uh, you know, they've been, you know, these dates have been popping up and it never happens. Is there a reason why? Well, I've been involved in the disclosure movement with Steve Bassett and, you know, Dole and Bassett, all the Alfred Weber, all the people um, professionally for, you know, Victor Vigiani, of course, um, for many, many years. And my take on it is that um, um, probably the Space Force is going to turn out to be the biggest disclosure piece, mm -hmm. the United States Space Force, um, because it's going to start bringing out, uh, people are going to start leaking out um, information about, you know, that was gleaned from extraterrestrials or, you know, back engineered or whatever, but that will be also then encased in a whole bevy of propaganda. Oh, yeah. But for me, so I've been very involved in the sort of political political scene. Um, but for me, um, disclosure is always grassroots. Disclosure is one CE6 at a time. One CE6 human opens to that knowledge at a time. Mm. Um, I had a funny experience when I was in Washington DC. So I was, I was setting up um, a meeting for Edgar Mitchell and myself with John Podesta. Do you know John Podesta? Have you heard of him? Yeah. yeah. So at the White House, he was um, Obama's legal counsel. So this was like 2014. And I got through to him and um, he was very gracious and he offered for us to meet in, uh, in 2014, the week of August 11th. And Edgar had just been to uh, Switzerland and not been feeling well. And I didn't know, he lived in Florida, I lived in DC. So I didn't know the extent to which. And then when Podesta came back with the meeting, he was like, you know, I can't go, I can't make the meeting. And I'm like, mm. devastated. I'm like, devastated, you're kidding me. And we were going to use that meeting as a stepping board. So we were gonna to go to see Podesta as so that Podesta would open the doorway so that we, we can meet with Obama. That was the whole setup. So subsequently, Edgar passes away. The meeting gets canceled. Edgar passes away. And about two years later, Victor Vigiani, <laughs> I'm in bed. Victor Vigiani calls me on the phone and he's like, Rebecca, get out of bed and turn on your computer. I'm like, okay, okay, what's going on? He said, all of your emails just hit to John Podesta just hit the WikiLeaks dump. Oh no. And so I'm like, you're kidding me. So so I I was the one writing all the emails. So my email, my phone number, everything turns up in WikiLeaks and gets, I mean, to this day, I still get phone calls. No. From people researching WikiLeaks. Oh no, that's bad. <laughs> so, you know, you can kind of look at, you know, as Victor says it's sort of disclosure that didn't happen, but the fact that it went into WikiLeaks, it happened. So wow. I think there's probably a lot of that. And now, of course, you know, disclosure is being kind of managed by these CIA guys. Yeah. To the Stars Academy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's bad. Um, I it always thought. Surprise me. <laughs> I thought the, uh, you know, the new Space Force that came up was a sort of way to legitimize. Uh, you know, the, you know, the black budget to bring it out publicly. Well, I think if you, I think it's a whole warfare scenario. If you own space, you own the globe. Yeah, that's true. It used to be if you own the oceans, you own the globe. And now yeah. it's if you own space, mm. you own the globe. So it's yeah. very much, you know, it's a war fighting. It's a, it's a weapon, uh, it's a weapon scene. It's, it's a surveillance, certainly a surveillance scene. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the thing that really surprised me, and I don't know, because Trump's not gone yet. No. But, um, or if he's going to go yet, I don't know what's going to happen here in America. But um, Trump is probably the most um, informed president on the UFO file of any. I think so. Because, you know, there's a tipping point. Something's going to happen. Yeah. 
And, he had and that his whole, do you know about his connection to his uncle John Trump? And no. no. So Trump had an uncle named John Trump and he worked at the MIT Rad Lab. So radiation lab. And he worked under a man named Vandevar Bush. Not, no relation to George no. Bush. And Vannevar Bush ran, ran the UFO file for years. So John Trump had immediate access to the UFO file uh, through Vandevar Bush. When Tesla died, um, John Trump was sent by Vandevar Bush to get um, Tesla's papers. So he not only had access to, um, Trump not only has access to the UFO file, but he also had access to the Tesla file and or you know information passed on to him and he also had direct access to um to nixon and nixon was one of the instrumental founders of nasa and project blue book ran project blue book for the government and trump also had a lot of access through uh, jfk wow and through um jfk son john kennedy okay so um, he had, he's got the whole. Uh, well, the family pedigree's in there for sure. Uh, he's involved yeah. a lot. Yeah. So he knows a lot. So for him to move from space command that's been around for about 30 years and formalize it into a space force. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, he knows something that's going on. Yeah. Well, hopefully something good's going to turn out because yeah we're screwed if uh, if they do weaponize at least oh they're uh, already weaponized oh really trust me oh in oh. space oh for sure oh yeah well, for sure well i wonder if the you know the whole californian uh you know you know the whole burning is related to that uh, i think that's more related to or, um, or antifa yeah. perhaps no i don't know if it's antifa but um you know, a lot of those burns are on um, are on uh, volcanic fault lines oh. that run through the state, and they're thinking that a lot of the fracking, as well as the electrical installations, that's why they keep turning off the electrical installations in California. Okay, that they were somehow there was an electrical component, okay. and so then you have what wouldn't surprise me is that the possibility that. You know, you never never let a crisis opportunity go to waste. Oh. So, so we have these wildfires caused by you know volcanic movement, earth crust movement, electrical fracking, all of that. Well, in the midst of that, you know, let's experiment with some you know directed directed energy weapons and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So okay. that's how I that's mm -hmm. how I see that possibly happening. Okay, but I also, you know. One of the reasons I'm so careful about CE5 mm. is kind of going back to the Carol Rosen affidavits. You, you familiar with that with yeah, Werner von Braun? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you go back to the Werner von Braun, Carol Rosen affidavits, and and you know he shared with her about how um, you know first it's going to be I don't know the Cold War, and then it's yeah. going to be terrorists, and then it's going to be um, nations of concern like North Korea. And yeah. then it's going to be meteors. meteors yeah. And then it's going to be meteors. aliens. And yeah. that is how we weaponize space. Those, those were the steps in how we weaponize space. So if you have a whole segment of society looking up at the skies all the time, okay, and then you combine that piece with um, to the STARS initiative, mm -hmm. and then you combine that with a holographic you know, mind control thing yeah. of, you know, we're being invaded. Yeah. Well, and you you've have got all these people believing in invasion via, via CE6. Yeah. So it's kind of like these stepping stones that kind of don't have to work together, but I'm just very careful around all that. Okay. That's why I think humans have to examine themselves, like what's real and what's fake. Well, not many have the, I guess, the ability to dif differentiate what's what's real, what's what's not. Um, I think we all have the ability, but, but it's whether or not we're going to use it or not. Yeah, that's it. Uh, it's a choice. Yeah. It's hard. Earth is hard work, folks. <laughs> it's hard here. 
I still wonder if the you know the nine one one plane was actually uh, holographic, you know the way it crashed into the building and you know the whole detonation thing. But I don't know. I think that that was probably another crisis that went to waste. I I mean, there's all that. Art. Did you read the Judy Wood? No research. Judy Wood. She's uh, the researcher. She's excellent. She's an excellent researcher, and she did a lot of of research on um, the directed energy weapon and how that it obviously, and there was an, uh, um, a tornado off the coast of New York that morning. Oh. That was another indication of. Something happened, okay. Wow. Yeah, something was happening. Some energy was being generated. Okay. She's great. You should listen to her videos, whatever. Okay. She's great. Okay. So uh, let, let's call it a night. We've been at this sure. for an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, time goes by so quickly when we. Um, so yeah, you, you're wonderful, Rebecca. Oh, thank you. So yeah, are you. You're yeah. so knowledgeable, and I love your hair. I'm a big talker. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so well, just, you know, thanks for coming on and sharing. Yeah, your story. wish you the best of luck. Please, please let me know. Um, what the Institute can do for you mm -hmm. and your listening audience. And I mean, we're here to, to be of service. We're here to, I mean, if you come across um, maybe somebody in the mining industry that's a, uh, or yourself mm -hmm. as an experiencer and wants to bring something forward an innovate inno innovation or an invention or an idea. So if uh, anybody forward. watching that want to yeah. contact you, they could do it from your website. Yeah. From my website, my emails on my website. Okay. Or it's my emails are hardcastlewright at gmail.com. Okay. Or you could also pick it up off WikiLeaks. <laughs> 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 Whatever's you faster. Don't mind. Yes, That's whatever. So funny. Or Facebook or, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay. so, um, so, yeah. So thanks for coming on again. Thank and you. You're so Good nice. luck. And for those watching, um, more experience interviews coming up. And I'll see you guys next time. So take care, everyone.